Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for coming out despite the weather. And, and to our visitors, uh, welcome to beautiful DC in springtime. Um, for those who are watching on the live stream, actually, there's a very uncharacteristic snowstorm outside. Uh, so again, thank you to everyone who braved the elements to come here today to New America, a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy institute that invests in uh, new thinkers and new ideas to address the next generation of problems for the United States and for the world, with a focus on preserving our foundational values in a time of transformative technological change. I'm Kevin Bankston. I'm the policy director of the Open Technology Institute, which is the tech policy and tech development wing of New America that's dedicated to fostering, uh, amongst other things, a stronger and more open internet for a stronger and more open society. Um, right now, we're facing a pretty unique threat to that internet, and I'm really honored today to welcome three leading European policymakers who are visiting DC from Germany to discuss with policymakers and advocates um, one of the most pressing issues for the future of the internet, and that is uh, government surveillance, and especially mass surveillance. So today, we're having what we'll call a transatlantic dialogue uh, about that issue um, and talk about some of the potential policy solutions uh, to address those issues. Uh, just to tell you what we're going to do, we're going to probably have a conversation of about 40 minutes after I give some introductory remarks, then about 20 minutes of questions from the audience, um, and then uh, people can finish their lunch or have refreshments or whatever. We're going to leave plenty of time for offstage uh, chatting with our guests. So to introduce them, um, at the end uh, of the row, we have Konstantin von Notz. He's a member of the German Bundestag of the Green Party. These all gentlemen are members of the Green Party. He was elected in 2009 as a member of the Committee on Internal Affairs and is a Green Party spokesman for topics related to digital rights. He's also Deputy Chairman of the Green Party delegation in the Bundestag and studied law at Heidelberg. Um, in the middle, Jan Philipp, Jan Philipp Albrecht. He's a member of the European Parliament uh, for the Green Party. He was elected in 2009. He's a member of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice, and Home Affairs and serves as a Green Party spokesman for Justice and Home Affairs. Um, he's recently been very central to the debates on data retention and online privacy, studied law in Bremen, Berlin, and Brussels, and specialized in IT law at the universities of Hanover and Oslo. And then finally, Malte Spitz, a uh, member of the Federal Council of the German Green Party. He was previously, from 2006 to 2013, one of six members of the Green Party Executive Committee. And he focuses a lot on digital rights, privacy, and civil liberties. Um, he's a founder of the initiative ProNet's I can't actually pronounce this. Mm, Pro net neutrality. Uh, net neutrality. Which, which, yes, is in favor of <laughs> net neutrality. Uh, and right on, a member of the Chaos Computer Club, or CCC. Um, uh, many privacy folks in the US know Malta based on uh, his lawsuit where he successfully got T-Mobile to hand over all of his location records, which was then made into a really interesting visualization online at uh, Dizite. Sort of showing his movements over a very long period of time and was one of the better illustrations of just how much data phone companies have on our location. You should Google it, it's really cool. Um, these gentlemen are here in DC thanks to Heinrich Ball, which is a think tank associated with the Green Party uh, in Germany that focuses on a wide range of topics. Um, they have 30 office locations uh, over you know, five continents, a uh, really excellent institution that is co sponsoring today's event. Uh, which is just the latest in a series of collaborations between our organization and Heinrich Boll. Um, they organized a similar delegation of visitors in 2012, and we held uh, an event then. Constantine was, was here for that. Uh, they also helped us organize the International Summit for Community Wireless Networks when we held that in Berlin last year. So we want to thank them for helping with that, uh, helping make this event uh, a possibility, uh, and we look forward to continuing to work with them. Um, so to the issue at hand, and I'm going to just realize my introductory comments are rather long, so I'm going to try and keep them short, but Snowden opened a breach of trust between the US and Europe, and the casualties have included public trust in the internet and the credibility of the US government as a global steward of that internet. Um, the architecture of the global open internet is under an enormous amount of pressure as a result. Uh, the prospects for meaningful reform are still very uncertain, Meanwhile, and somewhat ironically, it may be that the revelations about the NSA's conduct uh, have created new threats to the open internet um, as governments around the world consider ways of locking down and gaining 
stronger national control over the internet in their countries in ways that could threaten the free flow of information and uh, free expression and internet freedom. Um, something that's sometimes called technological sovereignty or a term we don't particularly like, the balkanization of the internet or, or the creation of a splinter net of bordered internets. Um, the topic of today's conversation is how can like-minded leaders on both sides of the Atlantic who are concerned about mass surveillance, especially mass surveillance over the internet, um, fashion a new transatlantic paradigm or dialogue uh, on how to modernize surveillance policy for the 21st century. Um, this is not an easy task, but there are people on both sides of the Atlantic that have a deep interest, political and economic, on repairing the damage that's been done. Um, and in many ways, Germany uh, is in a unique position here uh, with perhaps the most credibility. Combining German political and economic power with the fact of the country's very deep historical sensitivity um, to state surveillance, and then combining that with the outrage in that country over, amongst other things, the NSA's year-long wiretapping of Chancellor Angela Merkel's uh, cell phone, adds up all to what I hope will be um, a really potent ally uh, in the transatlantic fight for uh, a reformed government surveillance regime, not just in the US, but around the world. So, just as Germany has been a global leader on data privacy, we're hoping that uh, Germany is going to be a great leader on privacy rights in the intelligent and law enforcement context. Um, so we're very fortunate to be joined today by these three uh, particular uh, outspoken uh, political leaders on the questions of data privacy and state surveillance, and I'm hoping they can help shed some light on these issues. Um, I'm going to walk through a variety of questions, uh, talking about the political response in Germany, the political response across the EU, um, what the economic impact you imagine is, is, or is now or is going to be from the NSA revelations, um, particular technical responses that might be appropriate to the NSA surveillance, um, and what the future of transatlantic collaboration on this issue might look like. So, but to start with a very general question directed to any and all of you, um, can you describe the public reaction in Germany to the NSA revelations? And how much of that has been directed at the news of Chancellor Merkel's wiretapping and how much at the sort of broader surveillance infrastructure that's been revealed? Well, <clears throat> the tapping of Merkel's phone was um, um, a turn, turning point for the discussion, um, not because people were so surprised that governments uh, were spying on each other, <clears throat> and I think that's not uh, such a surprising uh, thing overall. But everybody in Germany knows Angela Merkel and has some kind of relation to her, yeah, good or bad. And um, someone like her with her uh, East German biography being uh, tapped on for probably 10 years. Um, with all the talks she did on the phone, that's what people suppose. Uh, that's uh, what happened. Um, uh, people got the idea that this abstract thing we discuss, mass surveillance uh, after the Snowden files, um, became very concrete to, to people. So it was a breaking point in the discussion. And um, we, we have a... Um, a big discussion in the Bundestag as well about this, those subjects. And from our point of view, the green fraction in the Bundestag, we don't believe the defense story of the government. That is that um, the NSA and the USA <coughs> are pretty much evil when it comes to surveillance. And Ms. Merkel and Germany is a poor victim in this uh, um, mass surveillance issue. We believe that um, Germany takes part in something like an international data transfer um, circle um, where um, agencies spy on other countries, harming the constitutional rights of those others, other countries because they're, they can do that, they're allowed to, and then meeting every other week and exchanging um, Festplatten. Hard 
drives. hard drives, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just ex exchanging the hard drives. And um, we have an inquiry now in the German Bundestag since last week, and we will try to prove that uh, Germany is playing uh, an active role in uh, uh, this system. And to, um, s our hope is uh, that uh, uh, this blame game stops then and we get a real discussion about um, how far can, can a government go uh, by surveilling. That's, that's really interesting to hear. I, I'm, I'm going to have more questions about German law and where it fits uh, and German practices and where that fits in the broader landscape, but it's interesting you mentioned your party's rejection of this sort of good, good, by, good guy, bad guy narrative or the blame game. Is How prevalent would you say is that viewpoint in the broader German populace? Well, people try to feed, of course, uh, anti-American stereotypes with this discussion. But I would say now we have a very recent uh, urgent uh, things happening in, in Europe with the Ukraine. And um, I feel the way um, the U.S. deals with uh, the whole issue um, speaks for itself that, uh, I mean, it's not outspoken, but, you know, this victim role of, of Germany in this thing, uh, it, it's not carrying through. And so um, I think this view is changing. and. Um, we are asking, we are not the only party or not the only persons that are asking for the German responsibility. I mean, under the line, of course, it is a difference to this um, uh, surveillance issue overall. Um, uh, considering you, you uh, pointed it out, uh, the German history with two um, uh, totalitarian regimes in the last hundred years maybe more, even the last 100 years. But uh, so people have a very, you know, deep in their mind and in their families an idea where surveillance can lead to. And of course, we didn't have uh, uh, um, September 11th. And I always discuss this in the discussions we have in, in, in Germany. If uh, there would have been uh, um, such a thing like September 11th on German ground with the 3,000 uh, dead people, we would have a different discussion than we have uh, in Germany too. So knowing that, I think this is a turning point now, what we uh, uh, know because of the Snowden files. And um, we had an initiative uh, um, most recently by um, authors, hundreds of authors, um, Nobel Prize winners and uh, um, this initiative was uh, had one center sentence. Um, someone who is being surveilled is not free. And so without being pathetic, I think the question is that we have to discuss um, if we want to live in the free democracies we lived in the last uh, decades um, or if we are um, willing to give that up um, because someone who is surveilled is not free. Yes, Mark. I would just like to m mention <coughs> two polls because you ask about how is the feeling in, in uh, German society. There was a poll, I think it was around uh, December, and it was asked, is the, is the U.S. a trustworthy partner for Germany. And 70% uh, of the German population, or 70% in this representative poll said no. Um, and I think this is like a changing point, like especially after 1889 80, 80, 80, 80, and everything, there was still a close relationship relationship and I would also call it friendship between the two two societies at the end and I think this was really like a hard damage and the second poll was uh, Germans really closely closely relate all this spying activities to the 
to the o o Obama administration. Mm -hmm. There was a second poll was saying like uh, in 2008, 2009, Obama had around 88 percent in favor in the German population. Like Obama was the biggest star in German politics. He got even more support than our own politicians and uh, ask for his and ask last year I think it was around 40 percent only. So I think this is really changing the whole debate over the last eight to ten months how the German society hooks on the US because there is like some kind of coldness <laughs> coming up and uh, people just see they are, they, are, they are partners but they are n n n not any longer our friends we can trust on maybe. Oh, I mean that's that's profoundly worrisome. <laughs> those, those, are, those are not good numbers. One thing we've been looking at here at New America, we've had several events looking at the cost of surveillance. Not only looking at the dropping cost of actually doing surveillance such that mass spying is available on a level that you know, the Stasi would have really loved, um, but also looking at the costs of the programs economically to our foreign relations, et cetera. It sounds like you know, the cost even to our, the relations of uh, many of our closest allies is, is really profound, um, which I guess makes it all the more important and, and, and a good thing that folks like you are coming to DC to try and build bridges, at least with, with those here who are working to try and rein in the NSA. So I'm wondering if you could tell us more about what you're doing here in DC, the message that you're carrying to lawmakers here, and how they're responding to that. I think that uh, actually um, we try to uh, bring it a, a bit away from, from this foreign relation and, and cultural uh, uh, clash uh, debate which it was uh, since, since eight months now. And that's why we say uh, let's not look anymore and the, uh, at this blame game or in the form of this blame game because these numbers which Malte just brought out are there because of this blame game and this cultural gap debate taking place and because the concerns, the substantial concerns, have not been uh, uh, appointed from both sides, from yeah. Europeans and from the US. And that's what we try to bring in uh, in Germany, in, in, the, in Europe, but <coughs> also here, that we should talk about the substantial concerns, which, by the way, are, in our view, more or less the same for US consumers and citizens uh, as for German uh, citizens and consumers or uh, that you can could, could say for all EU citizens and consumers uh, because we are talking about the question uh, of I, on the one side uh, what can governments do in general, what's proportionate when it comes to uh, the infringement of privacy rights and, and civil liberties uh, uh, for, for the purpose of uh, assuring security or effective law enforcement and what is effective at the end also. But also uh, what's the reasonable expectation uh, of privacy and self-determination, we would say, as Germans uh, with having informational self-determination as something which is, uh, I would say, going a bit uh, uh, abroad from privacy only uh, to uh, the um, the possibility of human dignity and, and self-determination of personality in a digitalized society. And I think that's what we need to talk about and what's a concern for all of the citizens in, in more or less Western democracies at the moment because uh, uh, people realize that this obviously, yeah, uh, is, is not any longer in the full disposition of our political leaders on a national level. Uh, because we are in a globalized digital economy, because we are in, uh, in, a, in a world where since a decade the threats are more or less international, where the reaction to it also is more or less international, where intelligence services exchange information and, and, and all of this is happening. And we pose the question, what's our common reaction to it? Yeah. Do we have a transatlantic uh, uh, answer uh, as Europe, as uh, uh, as United States, uh, or also 
perhaps even abroad OECD uh, states on that? And uh, is it decided together with citizens and consumers? Do we debate it or uh, uh, do we just, uh, I mean, react on a more or less symbolic level? And I don't think that this would be sufficient. And uh, we need to now deliver some, some very concrete answers to it. And maybe let me add <coughs> one thought. Since um, these, all those discuss discussions are most likely uh, related to uh, the governments itself and to the executive side. Uh, we are very interested in talking about what can parliamentarians do, what can parliaments do uh, to get this problem solved somehow. Um, see, I, I guess uh, you have this discussion here in the US, but we uh, have it as well, not that strong yet. Uh, uh, about um, the failure of um, um, the oversight of, of secret agencies. And um, I think um, uh, there is a need of um, alliance between parliamentarians internationally um, against mass surveillance and, and for a stronger um, oversight of the agencies because they just uh, took off and, you know, they are doing what they think they are supposed to do. And um, um, I guess the executive side is not the best side uh, to, to border that. Um, uh, the parliaments have to do this. And uh, I think they're on the European Parliament side, but the German as well, since we have the oversight on our uh, agencies. And uh, I think you, you have this discussion, and I, I hope uh, that in the end you will get uh, a much stricter and stronger oversight um, um, so we can uh, control those agencies and what they do in secret uh, uh, much better. Well, so our, our Congress currently, um, in the news today actually, there's a new bill from the leaders of the House Intelligence Committee uh, and also uh, uh, we're hearing a new proposal that'll be coming from the Obama administration uh, that would end the NSA's bulk collection of phone records um, under under the USA Patriot Act, Section 215. Um, much of the debate here has focused on that program. Um, I think, one, because it's the one that we know most about. It is the simplest to understand. Um, and it clearly impacts the privacy rights of many, in fact, practically every American. However, there are vast other aspects of the NSA's activities, including programmatic wiretapping under uh, the FISA Amendments Act, Section 702, uh, which allows broad authority to capture international communications from here in the US. And then there is all the surveillance happening outside of our borders yeah. under strictly the president's authority, um, including hacking of Google and Yahoo's data links between their data centers. We heard recently stories of the capture of webcam images being used on Yahoo Messenger, um, address books being moved between these companies, uh, and tapping of fiber optic links outside the country. So I've pretty much loaded the question here, but I'm wondering, do you think Congress's focus on the bulk records program is sufficient to address the global concern about out of control surveillance? Will, will, will an end to the phone record program restore trust in any meaningful way, or is more needed? Well, it's a, <laughs> it's a good first step, of course, to uh, uh, take care of those issues. But in the end, um, we have a global world. And um, uh, with allies, uh, you can't measure. You know, It's a question of human rights. And you can't uh, um, have different uh, um, measures on, on those questions. Um, uh, so especially for the acceptance. I mean, you know, in the, as the consumers are equal, uh, I guess they have to be equal um, looking at the consumer's rights as well. And um, we have a very strong discussion about the trust into um, American infrastructure, American technique, uh, uh, yeah, the whole Apple thing. Um, and it will harm uh, um, um, economically interests very much over the next years, I guess. Um, and it's an odd thing, uh, I think. I just went uh, to the CBIT uh, 
a big uh, a computer uh, um, ferry there in Hanover, where many um, industries uh, related to computer technique uh, are coming together. And these people don't understand why they have to invest now billions of, of uh, euros um, to safe up uh, their infrastructure, their data, um, while on the other hand, the government with tax money uh, is trying to infiltrate uh, 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 their networks. And I think it's a ridiculous uh, uh, story <laughs> overall, if you look at it. Um, so the, the government uh, has to uh, take back those actions in, yeah, and, and you need in, in the United States, you need a discussion. I would suggest how you win back the trust of European consumers. And if you have these two different uh, measures, values, is that the right term? Yeah, in, in um, looking on uh, human rights and, and privacy issues for, for those computers, you will have a major acceptance problems, a problem um, with good reason, I would say. I mean, on the other hand, you should picture this the other way around. Um, yeah, German technique, I don't know, automobiles, having good standards in Europe and very bad standards uh, <laughs> here, you will have a funny discussion and, uh, um, and no acceptance for the products. So I would uh, suggest that uh, the Obama administration uh, is, is looking fast on this next issue. Just one point maybe, <laughs> because you ask uh, if the, if the, stricter regulation of the bulk phone data collection of US citizens will be enough. I think if this will be the only legislative like, like step forward on all of this, I think there will be not that much satisfaction in the EU overall. Uh, I think we have to have a debate if we want to build up a single digital market between the US and the EU, that you have to have a common playground how to protect civil liberties on both sides of the Atlantic. And then you can't say only because it's, uh, it's a German citizen using Google Mail, I can collect all the informations here in the US about him uh, because then we will have the debate, okay, then German citizens won't use any longer Google products or they won't use any longer an iPhone, an iPhone 5S because over the couple of last years, consumers were looking on an iPhone and say, great thing. And, and, and at the moment they're saying, oh, it's a really cool spying device. Uh, and if this imagination of US technology w will be there even in, the f even in the future, I think that it will be really a hard fight for y US companies to get back trust from EU consumers on their, tech, uh, on their technology uh, because then they will ch change their behavior and we already have a debate in the EU to start rebuilding our IT industry. And I think if there will be a step forward uh, on all these issues like open hardware, which European companies and European uh, universities say, okay, this is something where we want to go out with. Uh, I think this could ch 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 change the field because Europe has the possibilities to build something like this. All the plants were closed over the last 10 to 15 years, but we, but we still have all the technicians and all the engineers to do this. And, and actually, I don't want to have this because I, I don't want to have a European technology and US technology and Chinese spying technology and I, I don't know what. Uh, but I think if we don't 
want to have a situation like this, then I think we have to change something. And I think really to <laughs> have a debate about how are EU consumers are protected if they use US <laughs> technology is something we have to talk about. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I would really say that uh, there are two points uh, which clearly say that if that would be the only thing, it would not at all be sufficient. Mm -hmm. That's clear. Because uh, the, the one thing is, like uh, Mate and Konstantin already said, uh, seen from a European perspective, EU citizens are not at all protected on the same level like US citizens and residents under these laws. So it's clearly we have to talk about something here. And we are negotiating, by the way, since years, uh, trying to get as EU changes in US le legislation on the protection, legal redress possibilities for EU citizens uh, with the concern of uh, data processing issues. Um, but I think there's also a second point why um, also US policy needs to open up for a transatlantic debate, not only on trade, but also on common values and standards. Because uh, if you look at uh, not only European citizens con and consumers, but also US consumers demanding for uh, privacy protection online, for example, for uh, not having everything collected and s sold everywhere, it's growing. It's not, I mean, uh, it's not that people don't care about it. I in fact, I think that in the past, uh, for seen from, from, uh, from an EU perspective, at the US, we talked always about the, the issue that US citizens only are concerned about uh, government surveillance, but in fact, it's changing. People are concerned also about uh, uh, companies uh, gathering uh, uh, personal information on them and, uh, and uh, trading it uh, somewhere without them uh, having any rights on that. And I think that there should be also recognition of the need for uh, regulation on, on these things. And uh, there have been uh, different papers from, from the White House and also from different uh, Congress members throughout the last years. Nothing really turned out to be uh, uh, to result in legislation. Uh, there's some state legislation. But if you look to Europe, we are doing now uh, our single data protection regulation to better create a single standard for the European market at least and to better uh, create trust of European citizens into technology from Europe into uh, services which are on the European market, I think that this will be also the case for US citizens and consumers demanding for. So uh, this is now a unique moment to, uh, to build on and to, uh, to try to get this already from the first moment together because uh, tomorrow we will talk about uh, a race to the bottom uh, which is started off from the Indian market or from the Chinese market. And US consumers will be very concerned about uh, some uh, services or products having very low security or data privacy standards. And uh, uh, that's an issue, I think, which we should talk already now about. And uh, I would say that it would be uh, the natural follow-up to what uh, Obama is presenting right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's worth noting uh, that, that uh, so you mentioned there has been a previous administration proposal, a, a consumer privacy blueprint that they issued several years ago exactly. that didn't, didn't result in legislation. Um, and now uh, President Obama in his speech about the NSA in January, in addition to announcing certain reforms and initiatives on NSA, has opened a new process led by John Podesta at the White House to inquire about the issue of big data, both in the government and the consumer and private context. Um, that process is actually soliciting comments by the end of this week. Um, get your comments in. Um, and uh, so it, it remains to be seen what that process is going to result in. Um, some viewed the timing of it to be somewhat suspect to the extent that it might be viewed as or could serve as a diversion of attention from the NSA issue uh, to the companies. Um, speaking of the companies, I do want to talk about what their role in this uh, can and should be. Uh, but talking about the sort of single digital marketplace, you know, consumers tend to expect that they're going to get the same deal as everyone else. And I think that goes for privacy as well as, as other things. Um, and in the human rights context, there's a growing discussion about the need to establish common human rights standards around surveillance, regardless of where you are or of which country you're a citizen. Um, on that point, I'd point people to the uh, to necessaryandproportionate.org, where are, there are some principles, the international principles on the application of human rights 
communication surveillance that a great number of civil society have signed on to. Um, it, there are a number of principles, but the main one really boils down to mass surveillance, untargeted surveillance of many, many people who are not particularly suspected of anything is neither necessary nor proportionate under human rights law. Um, but if you look at the actual laws of individual countries, uh, and we actually did a study, uh, Ben Scott, a fellow at New America uh, at the Open Technology Institute, collaborating with uh, researchers in the UK and Germany, recently did a paper comparing US law to German law uh, to UK law. And all of them shared some pretty striking commonalities. It's all in terms of intelligence authority. It's all very secret. Um, it protects citizens and people inside of the country while extending very little protection to people outside of the country or to international communications. Um, and for you know, uh, those who are interested in defending the US system, the US at least does have a court of a kind, the FISA court, overseeing the surveillance activities of the NSA, while in other systems, including in Germany, uh, it's, it's the executive or the chancellery in Germany overseeing, um, overseeing the intelligence surveillance. So it seems like, and I think there's one, concern from some in the US that, well, you're basically telling us to unilaterally disarm while everyone else's laws are basically of the same structure or even less protective, but also you can seems to it. highlight. I, huh? mean, I mean, and you can use it. Imagine that the NSA can also use the capacity of the BND spying on American citizens. I mean, mm -hmm. you could, should think about that. That's including. I mean, uh, that's uh, what happens. Exactly. <laughs> so I mean, it seems that this is a common problem and not a not well, a one specific <coughs> to the NSA. No, of course. I mean, that is the story, <coughs> and this is it's not a black and white uh, uh, game. This is what we are saying all the way. Uh, even if it would be very easy, you know, to play this play this this blame game, I I think the question is. Um, uh, secret agencies in the 21st century with the technique we have today, if you think about what is coming up the next five to 10 years, um, <clears throat> with all the uh, uh, technique and internet uh, possibilities that are going into cars, with Google Glasses, with um, uh, um, our energy system um, connecting by smart grid and so on, if our secret agencies get a grip on all those data, this big data issue, you will not live in a free society anymore, period. And you will not do this in Europe and not in, in uh, the US. And so the question for me is um, how far can parliaments um, uh, strengthen up uh, the, the oversight of those uh, agencies and um, we need a discussion in how far um, uh, we are not using those possibilities anymore, even that we could do it. Yeah. So, yeah, should those agencies do what they can just because they can do it? And um, and that's a discussion we need on the values we had the last decades together, and. Um, I mean, the best example for this time change we are living in, or for the threat there is, is that you have today China uh, in the American newspapers complaining about their rights of being not surveilled uh, by the NSA. Yeah, uh, They are claiming human rights or <laughs> what's I mean, and now look at their uh, system and their relation to human rights issues and we are losing um, um, an authority there. The Western world, the free world, is losing, losing an authority there because of this scandal or however you want to call it. And we have to, uh, to, to fight that back. And, um, um, and it's important to see the development standing in front of our door coming up the next uh, uh, years. Um, yeah. I mean, it does, uh, you mentioned China, it certainly does hurt American credibility to constantly be saying, China, stop hacking into our systems, stop hacking into our systems, and then, of course, have it be revealed that, if, well, we're hacking into their systems too. Or um, the US being a champion of internet freedom across the world, and then it being revealed that basically the NSA has, you know, compromised thousands and thousands of computers across the world and installed botnets to, yeah. you know, do massive bulk surveillance. Um, it seems that 
if we lose that credibility and other leaders lose credibility as well, we, we could quickly descend into, well, for lack of a word, a war of all against all on the internet. I mean, it could just end in chaos. So the question becomes, where does leadership come from? And one particular question there is, what role does the EU play in this? I mean, considering that law enforcement and intelligence authority isn't actually in the EU jurisdiction, what role should Brussels be playing on this issue in terms of exhibiting leadership? I mean, uh, it's, it's in fact still also uh, a particular situation uh, for the European integration process because national security in Europe still is completely in the hands of uh, the uh, member states uh, authorities, which also makes it very complicated for us as, for example, the British are telling uh, their EU partners, listen, we're doing what we want to do and we're not telling you anything on what we do with the GCHQ, mm -hmm. which uh, sometimes also questions a bit uh, in which situation uh, we are together as a sometimes also yeah. value and, and uh, legal unity uh, issue. You know? so, but um, uh, as we also have uh, quite an advanced cooperation on, on security matters, on also on law enforcement matters, uh, we need to talk about uh, common, a common European approach also, and we need to talk about the possibility uh, to find already from the beginning, when we talk about common rules, perhaps an approach to find common ground with the US and with other partners we have, and allies or uh, people uh, in, uh, or governments which we really want to cooperate and should cooperate on these standards also, as it's also about the question which standard will be perhaps at the end prevailing in a global community, which is still not decided, as we know that we are not in a majority when it comes to rule of law-based democracies, I would say. Um, so we need to talk about that. But I also would say that uh, talking about the necessary and proportionate way how to control government uh, agencies and access to, for example, information, which is the big question, we also should talk about, and that's what uh, Constantine strived a bit and what leads uh, me also to the whole privacy question in general, should talk about the way how we deal with this information. Because if we talk about analogies uh, from the past, uh, then uh, we can talk about not allowing government agencies to access our houses. But uh, I mean, if we just leave the door open all the time and let everybody uh, go into our house, that's an issue of vulnerability also when it comes to our privacy rights. And when it comes to the control of, uh, uh, of government agencies, for example, if we, if we don't control what's happening, uh, we cannot really uh, get back to it. And there we come again to the point, talking about the Obama uh, initiative now, if you just uh, say, OK, we will only oc occasionally access the data, that's the one sto uh, story. But the other story is if that data then involves a huge amount of information about your life, and if there is a huge amount of information about your life out there, then your vulnerability as citizens in a democracy is also somehow uh, much bigger than uh, it has been in the past. So we shouldn't stop only uh, at the level of talking about necessary and proportionate government intrusion but we also need to talk about the control of citizens and consumers on their own lives. And that's what the European Union at the moment uh, does. That's the main task uh, and the main, uh, um, uh, yeah, the main activity of the EU institutions with the data protection regulation, which I'm working out for the European Parliament and uh, the European Commission is bringing forward quite strongly as European consumers um, announced again and again that they are afraid about very low or different standards coming to their market. Mm -hmm. And I'm very sure that this will happen also to US citizens uh, and consumers and that we are uh, again and again in a situation that it's not only about the economy, the transatlantic economy, which has to prevail in a global com economy, but it's also about transatlantic community of consumers, for example, or of citizens, which have to prevail uh, setting their own standards in a global market. We, we want to prevail our values, you know, and we can only do that if we do it uh, uh, on the highest level we can achieve. And that's, I, I would say, at least uh, the transatlantic level. So that would be the task for Europeans to do and to reach out uh, again and again uh, to US policy, which is, of course, in a difficult situation to start off uh, 
safeguarding standards at the moment as legislation uh, is unlikely to pass, but we need to talk about necessities. Mm -hmm. I just want to make three small points maybe. I think the first point, because you talked about the similarities between the US, the UK, and Germany, I would really love to see that there is also some outcry from the US that the European intelligence agencies are doing at the end all the same stuff. Uh, I, I think for G G Germany speaking, the BND as our a foreign intelligence agency, it's only maybe not doing su such big programs of mass surveillance because they are not that financed that good as maybe US agencies, but still if they would have the finances and if they would have the possibilities from, a, like from, their, from their smartness, I think they would do the same. And I think it's that we have to address something like this, that, that this is something where Western democracies have to talk about in general, do they, uh, do they have the possibility to do such types of mass surveillance? The second point is, I think we have to address what you mentioned a little bit, I would call it the public private partnership of surveillance between companies and state agencies. Like at, at, at the moment we see a situation in Europe, but I would also say here in the US, where companies have the possibility to collect as many information about the consumers as they want, all the buzzwords of big data and so on, and they have the possibility to do so because at the end uh, the uh, state authorities say, okay, you can collect these information, but if we want to have access to this information, we get the access and then you can collect all the information as you want. I certainly see that you have a certain situation where you have to have lawful interception and that you have to have situations where uh, you have to go to a company and say, hey, I have to know what kind of information is this person sharing. But I think it's at the moment completely unproportionate at the end and that we are not talking only about, I don't know, hundreds or maybe a couple of thousands of persons of interest. We are talking about millions of consumers and I think this type of public private partnership of surveillance has also to end and I think this can only work when it is a joint effort on both sides of the Atlantic because there are technology companies involved, there are telecommunication companies involved, especially in Europe where m most of the telecommunication companies are former state-owned companies. So there are these close ties for decades. And I think this is something where we also have to talk about. Um, so that raises a lot of interesting issues in the sense of there's obviously a, a public-private partnership between the government and the companies. You know, much of the government's surveillance activity relies on the activity of the companies, relies on the data that they collect. Um, at the same time, there's an emerging public-private partnership between the companies and civil society who are seeking reform of the government surveillance laws. Um, you know, we've seen this on the law enforcement side of things for many years, uh, a number of groups working to reform the laws that govern whether the government has to get a warrant before it can seize your email or track your cell phone in a criminal investigation. The companies had not ever been very interested in diving into the national security issues, even though you know we had over a decade of fights over the Patriot Act. Um, but since Snowden, um, and, and in particular responding to this serious trust problem and I think you know, the obvious economic impact, uh, they've been spurred into action. Um, they have joined with us on a variety of projects including demanding the right to be more transparent about what, type of compli what, ki what types of orders they receive and how they comply with them. Um, we've seen several of the companies come out and for the first time state as a policy matter that they do not believe bulk surveillance is appropriate and, and that Congress should pass, for example, the USA Freedom Act. So in many ways, the companies have been key allies 
yet at the same time enablers, how do you manage that tension? And say, for example, with data protection, which is an incredibly divisive mm -hmm. issue, um, especially with the American companies, how do you, how do you, and I, like, I'm asking for myself as much as anyone, like, how do you manage that tension? You know, as someone who has, you know, thrown, thrown tomatoes, rotten, rotten fruit at Google and Facebook over the years over, on a variety of things, but also mm -hmm. has to work with them to try and curb, you know, the authorities who can actually throw us in jail or deprive us of our rights, like, how do we balance that tension? Well, I mean, the companies have an ambivalent, ambivalent um, uh, uh, position to uh, what is happening. Um, several days after um, the Snowden files came out, I wrote to the nine biggest uh, um, IT companies, all uh, uh, American companies, um, uh, that they are not um, worrying about lobbying any law that there is, but where is their voice in this discussion? Yeah? Where are they saying this is uh, too much and we don't want it and why are they not fighting back um, uh, what the government does? So why is this secret corporation? Now there are of course laws and uh, they don't want to point out the uh, the problem too much and the problem is from our point of view I would say uh, two, what kind of data um, certain companies collect. See, our uh, jurisdictional law system um, in, in uh, um, uh, privacy understanding um, was built in the only one who is powerful enough to collect uh, this mass data is the government. So our constitutional rights are uh, only between the government and the the the, the people, the citizens, um, <clears throat> and now with this new technology, um, a company like Instagram with I don't know a handful of employees can collect data. Uh, only governments uh, governments with lots and tons of money uh, could collect twenty years ago. And so this ambivalent um, uh, uh, relation of the companies collecting data and uh, building up a honeypot the government always wants to get a grip on, um, it has to be discussed. And of course we are talking about limiting and regulating this um, uh, 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 collecting of data by private companies as well because the problems are pretty similar to what we are talking uh, um, uh, with by mass surveillance. Yeah? The, the individual rights of a person can be, uh, yeah, if, if, if Google hands me over all the data they have about you, uh, you can do nasty stuff with that. And um, uh, yeah, a person can be destroyed by tapping just one phone call. Now imagine what you can do with all his email uh, uh, um, uh, traffic um, and and we have to, to discuss this as well it is actually a, a problem that is very deep deeply connected to to another and that's something Jan is working uh, on the last uh, uh, two and a half years with the uh, uh, data um, uh, regulation, yeah. regulation in in Europe I, I would like to add just a sentence because this this story the story I, I think there's a change we are in a transformation process and so we all learn as a digital <laughs> or, or as society to get into the digital age and what I learned coming from a background doing more police and judicial cooperation more all the security and home affairs stuff I can tell you that throughout the last decades it has become quite clear that uh, whoever is, uh, carries the responsibility to do effective law enforcement and security will be required to use whatever is available to get things done, you know? And uh, society expects it from that, from them. So uh, the story of some, of some private company players to say, yeah, as long we just distinguish these two areas from each other, and just say that government surveillance need to be restricted dramatically, there's no harm in, in having dramatic big data collection uh, of companies. And I think that's completely naive. That's completely naive. 
Because of course, if I'm in a security agency and I'm responsible for it, I will do what is necessary to get security and law enforcement done. And it will be done in the future and we will expect them to do that. I think this has to be discussed uh, here also in US society because you cannot do this distinguish, uh, distinction anymore. It is, it is an ambivalence because of course for years we wanted to have both. We wanted to have big data and growth and uh, in innovation in the technology companies. And that's for sure a, a good development from the beginning. But we, on the same time, want to have um, good working uh, security and law enforcement. But uh, there, there is this problem at the end. And that's why I think we need to make up our minds on the possibility of safeguarding, for example, anonym, uh, anonymity or at least uh, data minimization while exploring the possibilities uh, of new innovation and technolo uh, technological uh, development. And I think that's possible. We can see that. There are already start startups doing very good things on the same level of, of innovation uh, by restricting the amount of personal information, for example, which is involved. But we, uh, we never had the situation that all this tax money, which was invested into breaking encryption, for example, and into surveillance measures and, and everything, was invested into uh, technical developments in safeguarding anonymity, for example, or into improving encryption. I think there's a mindset also which has to change a bit and uh, where uh, we can back together into a common approach also of consumers and companies going uh, for the common interest. Uh, and that's also because what Malte has said that many businesses are also caring much more about the sensitivity of their own information. Um, so I want to circle back to where we began before we go to questions. I'd like to go to questions soon and just talk about we began by the discussion of wanting to have a transatlantic dialogue between parliamentarians. How do we do that? What should that look like? Who should be involved? Can we help? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, actually, we are thinking about uh, uh, grounding, making an initiative um, called Parliamentarians Against Mass uh, Surveillance. Um, with a very plain uh, um, schedule, um, bring those parliamentarians together who are willing to say that they are fighting in the parliaments they've been voted in um, against mass surveillance, uh, yeah, not against security or uh, 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 safety interests or whatsoever, but against this uh, uh, mass surveillance. Um, and it should be uh, bipartisan, yeah, not a, a green thing and not a left thing or a conservative Republican Tea Party thing, but it should be open for each one of those who are uh, uh, fighting against this. And I, I, I would say it would balance out this discussion that only uh, the executive uh, um, level is, is um, discussing always with their point of view and their interests, uh, which are very close to the, uh, to the agencies. And um, I think it needs to be balanced out. And we try to uh, uh, reach out here to uh, some people from the Hill. We have uh, um, some meetings. And hopefully, people um, will join us. And uh, uh, we've talked to, to parliamentarians from other countries, Great Britain and um, so we hope that in the next month uh, we'll get uh, a good amount of people together to join in in that initiative. Well, let, let me know if there's anything we can do to help. Oh, sure. And I will. In the meantime, yeah. uh, let's go ahead and go to questions from the audience. Uh, yes, good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Paul Shankman from US News and World Report. I'd be interested to ask you about the memo that Edward Snowden wrote to the European Parliament. I guess that was three weeks ago now. And two particular points that he made. One, that the mass surveillance programs of the NSA have not prevented any major terrorist attacks. And two, that they're heavily overworking the analysts that are employed at the NSA um, who are forced to go through all of this data, which then yields very few results. I'd be interested to get your opinions on those matters. And in the coming weeks, or in the subsequent weeks, has there been any uh, follow-up from U.S. officials or leadership about um, that issue? 
I, I think that um, this has been a very important uh, uh, statement. Um, and we have posed these questions as the European Parliament because of also debates which already showed that obviously we need to talk about the effectiveness also of some uh, surveillance measures, which turned out to uh, not really uh, change if you look at statistics, for example, crime rates or clearing rates uh, also with regard to, uh, to attacks, which uh, are again and again claimed to be the reason for this surveillance. So I think it's important to look again at it and uh, to look, uh, look into the, fa to the facts and into where should we invest money and effort to effectively fight uh, a crime or terrorism. Um, that is something which I would say has been a bit bl blinded out uh, in, in recent years. And, and that's also what we as a Green Party have uh, in Germany and in Europe again and again brought uh, to the public debate with regard to the data retention laws which we have in, in Europe and which now are also in front of a court of the European Court of Justice and uh, where the Advocate General, for example, also refer, uh, referred to uh, some data showing that obviously it's not uh, necessary to uh, many uh, cases that there has to be vast retention to data, lengthy retention to data, and so on, but that it's more or less in most cases, and that has been also uh, the um, historical view back to some uh, attacks, the lack of cooperation between some agencies, especially when it's transborder cooperation. Uh, if you look at the Boston issue where there have been Russian authorities uh, obviously equipped with information not being shared very early, the same has been the case in southern France where there was an anti-Semitic uh, attack at a certain moment and uh, uh, there have been already information in, uh, in other agencies. So uh, I think that this will be something which we further have to debate also, besides uh, the fact if it's even uh, proportionate uh, in a democratic society. On that note, I have to throw in a plug for the work of our National Security Studies pro program here at uh, New America. Peter Bergen and that, and that group put out a study on just this issue, the effectiveness of the programs. And consistent with the uh, conclusions of the NSA Review Group and the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, did not find significant uh, anti-terror impact from those programs. But I also just want to make the point that, that we do need to address these programs' effectiveness. I don't want, I don't want us to back us into our, ourselves into a corner where if they prove, proved effective here or there, that that necessarily means they're OK. I think that we need to actually weigh the benefits and the costs and see how great are the benefits and how great are the costs, and are those trade-offs making sense, and whether the cost is economic or the cost to our rights whether human rights or civil liberties um, and the like. But the, the, the problem is that I think he is also somehow a creative interpretation of what necessary in a democratic society, for example, means. Because uh, throughout the last 10, 15 years, it turns out that in many occasions, it was meant, uh, obviously, to be only helpful. So not necessary, uh, absolutely, but helpful. And that's a different term. And we need to talk about these terms when it is about weighing the proportionality of an infringement into uh, freedom rights and civil liberties. I think that's a huge difference uh, if it just helped uh, in, uh, in addition to many other uh, issues which perhaps were even more helpful or already were sufficient, or if it was really necessary uh, to get things done. Uh, that's a huge difference if you talk about blanket retention especially. Yeah. May I add one thought? Uh, um, in, in Germany, the um, security agencies, the police, are always ar arguing for this blanket retention, um, not by statistics, because they know the statistics show absolutely no difference. We had the blanket retention in Germany for two years until our Supreme Court called it off. And in these years, uh, on the crime solution, Crime rates and clearance rates. Clearance rates weren't uh, um, uh, different from before, and so they always take the single case, yeah, the Einzelfall, um, a, a drastic, dramatic uh, example for where this could have have helped um, mm -hmm. um, to construct to construct a, a case where everybody with his guts would say, "Oh, of course, you need retention there," but. 
if you are arguing on that level, you will never be proportionate. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Jim Berger from. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Jim Berger <coughs> from Washington Trade Daily. Uh, from the beginning of this, uh, these these um, revelations over a year ago, uh, Brussels has been very uh, adamant that they want a written agreement with the United States. Uh, I don't know if not not spying on Germans or not spying on Angela Merkel. Um, but um, that was Berlin and Berlin. Paris. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, Germany and France, they wanted such an agreement. No spy agreement. No spy agreement. Yeah. yeah, no spy. <laughs> uh, what's the status of that? And, and is it a, a credibility problem here? We, we're dealing with over a year. No, it's I, the U.S. doesn't want it. And they said that several times. And we think it's absolutely uh, nonsense uh, uh, to make a, um, uh, between two countries a contract uh, yeah, with the GCHQ and other uh, uh, countries spying the same way and then exchanging inside the Five Eyes those, those data. Uh, so this is a, the whole discussion is a um, defense uh, argument of Angela Merkel, uh, why she hasn't done anything seriously in this uh, thing. And during the campaign last year, um, she said uh, two things uh, to, to uh, uh, fight that back. She said uh, they want the no spy agreement, and they said they want the uh, uh, data um, uh, solution, data protection uh, um, on European, on the European level. And both things failed. And so in the German debate, she has nothing to show what she did. Hi, uh, thank you, Ben Hancock from Inside US Trade. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, first, Jan, you talked about kind of a transatlantic digital economy and, and going beyond that and including kind of a transatlantic uh, consumers market and, and purveying those kind of shared principles that we have. Um, someone at the Atlantic Council yesterday was saying that uh, she doesn't think it's going to be palatable for TTIP to not address this issue in some capacity. Uh, so that's kind of linking the economic and the digital kind of human rights aspect. I wonder if you agree with that. I mean, the commission has said very strongly they don't want to touch anything related to trade or privacy in a US EU trade agreement. Um, do you think that that is a forum where uh, the US and EU should do something to maybe uh, enhance protections for EU consumers? I mean, I know that's been primarily negotiated in a different lane, but do you think this, that maybe TTIP is one forum? And also for, for Konstantin, I wanted to ask about the feeling in the Bundestag about, um, about TTIP as well. I know with the, the new coalition government, uh, my understanding is they haven't really articulated themselves, uh, the Grand Coalition, on this EU trade agreement. Do you think these NSA revelations have chilled that discussion? Do you think that this is becoming a serious problem, or is this something that is just kind of blowing over and, and, and being inflated in the press? Thank you. So I start with the first question, uh, which uh, is... Those that don't know the acronym TTIP. Uh, yeah, the, so TTIP, the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, Agreement, which is negotiated now between uh, the European Union Commission and, uh, and the US government. And uh, I mean, it's, it has its own story, of course. And I think that these, this story is t told very differently, by the way, still in the US and in the EU. And uh, I think that there will be quite a complicated future for these negotiations at the moment because of very different issues and uh, unoutspoken issues. Um, when it comes to privacy and data protection, I think it's quite clear that the prospect, the outlook uh, of a midterm development uh, in TTIP is perhaps f too long term when you talk about uh, 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 data uh, in EU-US because we already negotiate, as you said, par in parallel agreements uh, and we still have, or we have actually a problem already on the table which is very acute on, on Safe Harbor uh, where we need to talk about uh, how to fix uh, better enforcement of data protection and privacy uh, transatlantically uh, and the European Parliament is pushing uh, quite hard for it now. So I don't think it would be appropriate to address it. And I would say also in addition, and that might be a bit of a, uh, a green viewpoint generally, but uh, I think that it's, uh, that it's an issue. Uh, I don't think that trade agreements uh, between the US and EU will be the 
field where we are negotiating our standards and values together. I think tra trade agreements and TTIP will be an, uh, a development of, yes, we want to finalize uh, the common market, uh, but still, we have a task to do in our economies and in our societies, and that's uh, building up standards and values. If you just look at the trade agreement, as I said, the common denominator, denominator of in, uh, inside an, uh, a trade agreement is only most of uh, mutual recognition. What it happens uh, is that the lowest one is determining the standard. But if we talk about cre recreating trust of consumers into uh, the digital market, for example, and setting a global standard, we need to talk, uh, talk about a different approach. And uh, that is, uh, in my view, what is also uh, granting more success in achieving a result if looking uh, at the actual development of TTIP negotiations. Because on bo both sides of the Atlantic, there will be so uh, huge complications, and I don't see this happening uh, very soon. Uh, and I would say it's more urgent uh, to, to discuss data protection privacy now uh, on a transatlantic basis in parallel. So I would take it out of, uh, of the trade negotiations as the Commission has proposed it. <coughs> or not get, get it in. At the end, it's not in. <laughs> Let me just oh, oh, please, say oh, the second part. I make it short. It's, uh, actually, we have a very hard discussion in the Green Party about this uh, issue um, at a big party convention. And it was a big issue. Um, many uh, views on the subject overall. Um, I think there's a discussion about, you know, um, on the European level, each country has one topic in favor which they want off the table. Yeah? So, so the French, uh, they want uh, uh, media off the table and uh, um, the the Germans the German farmers want to take the agriculture out um, and the German uh, um, um, ök ökolog wie sagt man uh, Umweltleute uh, ecology, ecology people yeah, uh, they say this this whole thing is poison anyway uh, so <coughs> uh, if you start to take out uh, things out of this uh, treaty. Uh, it's it's hard to say where where this discussion will stop and, and if anything is left on the table uh, after people took those things out uh, which are important for them. So um, uh, I think TTIP has uh, um, so far a bad start and I'm not so uh, sure if it will survive this discussion uh, because of the uh, problems we have in this transatlantic mm, trust relationship, yeah, and and even the conservatives um, um, are very careful now saying TTIP that's a good thing, jobs, jobs, jobs. Um, so I would say it's a very difficult uh, um, uh, atmosphere surrounding for this uh, discussion and. Uh, uh, if there's not a totally new uh, a story to tell, I'm not sure if it will uh, carry through. Uh, Clay Ramsey, Program on International Policy Attitudes. I wanted to ask you whether the following is part of the discussion and discourse in Germany on um, the NSA, et cetera. Um, and it is not here, uh, because Germany has historical experience with very large, very professional um, security agencies. And um, historically, there is, is a tendency for uh, a division of such an agency to become preoccupied with a kind of social cartography of kind of building up and building up and building up its uh, kilometers of files uh, and uh, in a way that actually starts to escape the, the presumed purpose, even authoritarian purpose of, of the organization. I think that uh, both Stasi and Securitate in Romania had this tendency. And I don't see uh, that the 
the addition of digitalness makes a terrible difference in the current behavior of the NSA. That is, that it's the same kind of impulse. Now, this is not discussed in America, but I wondered if it might have already be something that is discussed in Germany. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think the G German debate is uh, pretty much focused even on the l last 80 years. And mm -hmm. I, I think uh, we had this really wonderful debate in Germany three years ago about Google Street View. And there was, I don't know, the, it, it was like for a couple of weeks, it was a huge protest all over Germany because people doesn't want it that their house was photographed by Google. And it was just the point because they said, this is my house and I don't want that a company or a state authority or who else takes a picture of it. And I think this is what a Jan, Jan mentioned at the beginning, this constitutional right of informational self-determination is something I would say Germans of all ages are fighting for at the end. Or at least this is, Im this is, this is Im 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 important for them. And I think this whole law and this whole decision by the German Constitutional Court 30 years ago who brought up this is informational self-determination right is based on German history. So yeah, we have the debate. Uh, but I would say it is good that we have this, this debate, but I, I think this should be the only point why we are against all of this. Go back. Hi. Um, Excuse me, Anna Neymark, Open Society Foundations. You've mentioned several times about uh, possible multilateral standards um, for surveillance, uh, digital surveillance. And I was wondering, and this is kind of a big question, um, but if you could mention some key concepts or overarching concepts that you would like to see in those standards. Uh, I, I can do it short on that because uh, there have been already since 20 years again and again conferences uh, 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 trying to work out these standards. Uh, at the end, uh, they have been very, I mean, uh, closed. Uh, it has been civil society, civil liberties movements, uh, and these results, what they have worked out, never really get a broad public uh, awareness. Now, with uh, the last eight months, I would say this public awareness is there. And we are talking about the values. And if uh, referring to what Malte just said on the idea behind what self-determination in a digital society is about, uh, there is, uh, first of all, some principles. I would say transparency is one of it. I need to know what's going on, you know, exactly uh, technological transparency also. Uh, there has been a movement since years called show me your algorithm. People have to understand what's behind what's happening behind the screen of my mobile phone what you know if i can overlook what's happening in my home that's one thing but i cannot overlook what's happening in my pocket in, with such a system you know we need some transparency rights we need uh, um, also uh, more or less a principle of intervenability i can object to data processing i can say yes i want or want not to be part of uh, information sharing uh, I should uh, have the right to, for example, correct information which is perhaps undue processed. Um, and I should, at the end, uh, have uh, some, some right uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to say I'm, I'm out of it. I'm, uh, I, I want to stay anonym, uh, anonymous. So data minimization as a principle, I think, is something which people... Uh, uh, would help to get their self-determination in a digital society done. Those principles have not been discussed very broadly, but they are in place since 30, 40 years in, in quite a lot of also international agreements already. And uh, I think we need to get that into the debates of top-level uh, policymakers because it's part of our digitalized uh, society. And just to add, I think <laughs> Kevin all all also said about the necessary and proportionate 
principles where the, there was worked on over the l l last one and a half years. I think these are points where you can work with and, this, and these are points you can bring into the political debate. And, uh, and since you ask how to cooperate with, with big corporations on this issue at all, I would say uh, if those corporations would really step up and say something like this is helpful and we should fight for it and we are only supporting parliamentarians or we are only supporting presidential <laughs> candidates 2016 who are signing these principles. I think this would m m make a difference if all the big IT companies say, okay, we have to go a step forward. We, we shouldn't, call and, uh, shouldn't call only about transparency. We also have to go this one or two steps uh, further down the road. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. This gentleman right there. Hi, thank you. I'm Andreas Ross with the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, it has been my perception in this town that even those people that would like to see the whole surveillance regime changed in the Congress, for example, are not exactly keen on finding, um, and I'll put it this way, foreign allies um, being attacked by the other side of the aisle as being against national security interests, uh, possibly. It might not even be helpful if you are considered someone who's doing something because you're German or other foreign friends may, may want it. So um, knowing that even the German government now with um, Foreign Minister Steinmeier's uh, announcement wants to treat this more, and I think like you do here, as a common, a common problem that needs to be figured out in a common discussion rather than just a dispute between two different nations. Have you really any substantial hope that you do find people joining um, parliamentarians from this country uh, in your group that would actually like to tackle this as a common, as a common problem facing different nations? Thanks. <coughs> are you hopeless or hopeful? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, we are hopeful. And um, we can't, uh, I can't tell you how this dis discussion will come out. Um, but if you take a look at the discussion here in the U.S. Uh, that has taken place, um, um, and it's a, a bipartisan thing, um, I'm hopefully that uh, this will go on, and um, and there will be the need will be seen that this is not an, a United States uh, uh, um, problem only. Um, <coughs> but uh, that it is in, in form of international questions, uh, something you have to discuss uh, uh, with your partners. And um, it's always difficult to say this without being pathetic, but um, if we don't want to see, I mean, I can see uh, uh, with the, the East-Western Cold War uh, uh, thing ending, uh, there are people that don't see the need for a transatlantic deep relationship as it was. Uh, uh, I'm not in, in, in on this point of view. Yeah? I believe that this is uh, a more important and this uh, um, a community of values, of special freedom, democratic values, um, is needed more desperately than e ever before. And um, if uh, people here in, in the Congress or uh, uh, in, in all uh, legislation uh, uh, parliaments here in the US um, are not willing to see that uh, you destroy trust um, uh, by not caring about how people uh, are treated, um, it's a high price you will pay for it. And the economic um, uh, problems connected to that, we, we try to point that out, um, is maybe a trigger to get people on our side. Because it is, I mean, as far as I understood, and uh, uh, two years ago we were here visiting um, the Silicon Valley, the key industry in this country is the IT industry. 
And if you only sell your phones to in the US, that's not what you need uh, in the United States. So you need the trust uh, in Europe to sell your iPhones there. And it should be uh, uh, a deep interest of all parliamentarians that are interested in uh, the economic wealth of the US uh, uh, to build this trust again. And I would say that's a good uh, uh, um, help to, to join in in such an initiative. And I'll say that I think that's a perfect conclusion. I am afraid we're out of time. But uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks so much for having thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>